Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dad Talk Today. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, UFC Hall of Famer, the Huntington Beach bad boy, Mr. Tito Ortiz. Tito, how you doing? Doing great, man. How are you? I'm doing all right. So, brother, how long has it been now that you've been in the MMA game? Uh, actually, it's been uh, since, was it 2019, uh, December 7th or December 6th of 2019 was my last fight. Uh, last time I competed with the UFC, though, was uh, 2013. Um, and after that, I fought in Bellator. Um, and then I fought in Combate America, which was uh, my last fight in 2019. Oh, man, it's such a long career. And uh, I appreciate everything you do. One of my favorite fighters. What's what's that been like for you as a dad being a fighter as well? Um, you know, it, it, it's as being a fighter, you got to be really selfish. Um, and it's hard being a father because you can't be selfish at all. You know, uh, my number one is my children's future, and I got to make sure I'm, I'm able to mold them into the men they are now. Uh, my oldest son, Jacob, who is at Arizona State University on a full ride for wrestling, is 19. And uh, I think we've molded him perfect. Uh, not perfect, but, you know, uh, a good head on his shoulders. And then I got my twin boys, Jesse and Journey, who are 12 years old, and they're being homeschooled right now. Um, and once again, I just got to make sure you kind of juggle the balls the right way to make sure that uh, their future is uh plentiful their future is uh you know exciting so they love day by day in school uh, just at home but once again when i get done training i get back home uh, i make sure i'm always home right before they go to bed um, i make sure that I'm, I'm there in the morning when they go to school um it's important just being present as being a father um myself my father uh chose drugs over me and it was very hard growing up because i always try wonder, you know, why, why is, why is that happening to me? Why, why am I that kid? Why am I the one? Why, what's the matter with me? How come I'm not loved? How come I'm not the one that's being shown affection? Um, but I understand that my dad chose drugs over me and it was, it took me a while to understand it. I think I was about 24, 25, where I really got it. My mom wrote me a long letter, um, of like seven pages and explaining what our, uh, the lifestyle we went through during that time, the drugs that got, it, uh, uh, presents to them when my father had his appendix taken out uh, was heroin and um, for a painkiller and he just got wrapped up in it and he couldn't find the uh, strength to uh, defeat it. So I I, I held that against him. Um, and I probably shouldn't have, but at the same time, I think it made me the father I am today where I'm present for my, my kids. You know, I tell them I love them every day. I tell them I'm proud of them every day. And it's important to give your child uh, positive reinforcement um, of these things. And I, I think, you know, I wouldn't be the father I am if my father uh, wasn't as bad as he was. It's kind of crazy to, to say that, but uh, I refuse to be a victim. Um, I want to be a victor. And my legacy isn't being winning world championships, not being in the Hall of Fame or making millions. That's not part of my legacy. My legacy are my children. When I'm gone, I have two things for the rest of my life, my word, my name. And I won't, I teach my children these cha same things with respects, values, uh, you know, being um, positive uh, individuals to give back society in a positive manner. And that's what I'm, I'm building. I'm building men. There you go, brother. What was that like for you as a child hearing about uh, your father using those drugs? Is it something that you fully understood? I know that's got to be kind of a difficult situation for you. Well, you know, I, I, I was a part of it. You know, I wasn't a part of it. I was hearing it. I was seeing it. Um, and they were shooting heroin. I, I remember smelling burnt matches. And even to this day, I get flashbacks of just bad memories of it. It's just, it's hurtful. But I understand that I went through these processes to understand that uh, I can use it as a victim mentality or I can use them as a victor mentality. I've never touched heroin ever in my life. Uh, I, I have dabbled in tried other drugs um but i've come to realize that addictive personality is a choice and people say it's a sickness and in my opinion i believe it's just a choice to show you're a weak person or you're a strong person you can get through it and you can battle it and you can every single day is one step forward to being a better person or you can say you know woe's me and my father was a drug addict so i should be a drug addict drug addict uh you know i'm i went through gang as a kid growing up so it was just uh, I got away from that because it just didn't settle in my heart and in, in my soul the right way. It seemed like I was doing something wrong. It seemed like it was just a, a circle of events that were just continuing to re, uh, reoccur over and over and over again. So I had to get out of that at a young age, at like 13, when my mother left my father. Uh, my mother gave me an opportunity 
to actually, she saved my life when I was uh, 13. She got me away from my father. She got me to move back to Huntington Beach. And uh, my true name is Jacob. And uh, in the Bible, Jacob wrestled against an angel. The angel beat him and saved his life. Well, as a freshman, uh, of course, as a kid growing up, I was used to watch uh, WWF, uh, which is WWE now, professional wrestling. Um, and I wanted to be a freshman wrestler. And I told my mom when I was a kid, I go, Mom, one day you're going to see my name in big bright lights. It's going to say Tito Ortiz. And when I walked into the wrestling room as a freshman, I was hooked. I was just like, I was addicted. It was, that was my thing. I got the attention from all the parents. I got the attention from other students that were in school. I got attention from the teachers just as long as I was polite. You know, if I was a hard worker, if I did everything I said I was going to do, and that's what wrestling taught me. It taught me dedication. It taught me the sacrifice and rewards that I got out of those things of sacrifice. And, and uh, I started artists my first year. Um, I ended up uh, winning the CIF, placing in the state. And then, um, you know, I think those things kind of molded me as a young uh, adult. I was, I didn't even say young adult, I'm a kid. I was a kid at the time for freshman senior year. I was still a kid. Yeah. But I learned so many things in wrestling that it taught me not to replicate mistakes over and over again. If you made a mistake, learn from that mistake and move on. Don't, do, don't go back to that same situation. Don't look back, look forward. And these are things that I've learned through life that have helped me. But, uh, you know, as a kid growing up, I know it wasn't my fault. I know that um, it wasn't my choice. It was my father's choice. But once again, he wasn't man enough to step up and to be responsible for the child that was under his roof. And um, I did everything I possibly wanted to do and could do and whatever I wanted to do all the time. I mean, at the age of nine years old, fishing on Newport Pier, um, staying over the night, uh, sleep on cardboard and freezing freezing weather, not wanting to go back home because I didn't want to see them slamming heroin and uh, smelling matches and the gangs in the area. Um, all the way up to I was about uh, 12 to 13. And like I said, in 13, that's when my life changed. And my mother uh, made one of the best decisions ever and um, took me away from my father. And she got remarried and I had a second chance at life, you know, uh, wrestling gave me that opportunity. I'm very, very fortunate because of it. You know, I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, but w what was going through that with your father when you became a father? Was there any um, of those things? It's hard to give what you didn't have. Um, were there some mistakes that you got trying to not be like your dad? Or what was that learning process like when you became a father? Um, it was fear. I was afraid. I was afraid that I was going to mess up. I was afraid that, um, you know, I was going to do the wrong things, uh, not do the right things as a father. I wasn't sure what to do as a father. I was never taught how to be a father. Um, everything I knew in life wasn't what my father taught me. It was everything that I watched on television, everything I watched in the movies, you know, love, uh, affection, um, the hard hardships in life, just the type of things that normal people that would learn from their father or learn from their peers or learn from, you know, someone who's a, a role model in their life, things that I've learned on television. You know, I learned the facts of life from watching the facts of life. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy because as a child growing up and just seeing these things over and over again, that's what made me the person I am where I love America. I'm a patriot. I care about this country because I've traveled the world. I've seen how the world is and I don't want to lose what's here. So that's why I fight so hard for my children. But, you know, I, I look at the factor of uh, being a kid growing up that life is not easy life is not all you know mm. rainbows and flowers and it's 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 not it, it is really hard work this 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 earth can attack and 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 beat a person down mentally physically like no other and as i prepare my children i want to make sure that i'm doing the things my father didn't do and once again that that, that fear in my my mind and my heart of knowing am i doing this right and you know, I was married with my uh, ex-wife, uh, Kristen. Um, I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to have a child because I was afraid to make the mistakes my father made. But I got kind of pushed into it, and I'm very thankful that I did because I have a beautiful son who's smart, very articulate, and I was a strong patriot that I, that it makes me proud to have other coaches and other parents come to me and go, God, that that kid's very respectful. You got a really good kid. You've done a really good job. It makes me feel happy. It makes me feel really happy. And with my twin boys, exactly the same thing. They're like, wow, to have twelve year old kids sit down during dinner the whole time and not run around the table and screaming and shouting, to be very respectful and shaking hands and looking you right in the eye and um, you're doing well. And once again, I looked at the things my father didn't do 
and I try to fix those things by doing the right things, you know, um, opening doors for women, uh, shaking hands, looking them straight in the eye, saying yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, uh, just being respectful. And I think that's what's missing in our culture right now. It's just um, uh, kids, a lot of parents, I mean, not all parents, so I hope all parents don't feel like I'm attacking them, but there's a lot of parents that put their kid to the side. And number one, it is just about work, strictly about work, nothing but work, 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 work. They got a nanny, um, they got a housekeeper, um, they got a tutor to help with their kids. I understand it, that's fine. But I think time spending with your child is very important. And I'm glad my kids are being homeschooled right now because I'm spending more time with them than I've ever have. Um, but at the same time, I'm able to be a part of their life where I don't have a nanny taking care of them. Um, me and my uh, fiance, Amber, we are 100% hands-on with everything with them. So we understand what the psychological stuff they're going through because I went through those same things as a kid of questioning everything. You know, why am, why is this happening to me? Why, why is this? How come this is so hard? How come this is a little easier, but this is harder? Um, how come I can't have that? How come I can't have this? Well, we teach them with hard work and dedication, you can achieve anything. You know, just keep that dream going. And, that, and that's what we teach them we'll, through hard work. You know, they do their own laundry. I mean, not wash it, but they put it away. Yeah. Um, they take out the trash. You know, they clean up the house. Uh, we do check marks, like say they don't make their bed. Uh, if uh, they don't finish their homework, we do checks. So um, each one of those checks, uh, last year we stopped doing it. Um, we're, for every five checks, they would have to do one hour stairs. They'd have to run the stairs for one hour. Um, and that's maybe a little brutal, but once yeah. again, check marks stop happening completely. And uh, this year we started doing check marks where they got to earn it back by doing the lawn, by uh, dust in the house. Uh, of course, every day they have to wash dishes. Uh, one does one day, one does another, and they circulate through the week. But uh, giving them, I think, uh, just hard work of working for the next day to understand that just not given to them. And that was one thing that was a phrase of father growing up, it was giving my kid too much and giving everything he wants, then he gets everything. He's like, well, I deserve that. That's not how life is. And that's how I think a lot of parents can understand that life is not like that. Yeah, when you're a, a, parent, or a kid growing up and your father didn't give you everything you wanted and he made you work for those things, those are the things that what hard work and dedication is about. And those are the things that I had to learn because I mean, I got a job at 11 years old working on the boats and it was just not even for money. I just to go fish on the boat on the way back, I would scrub the boat down as a pinhead and up to about 15 years old then I finally got a job as a deckhand and that's all I did. I fished and I loved to work because I made money. It paid for my lunch, paid for my dinner, paid for my breakfast, uh, snacks. Um, I was able to buy clothes. And these are the things that um, normal life is is about that I think lost in our generation that are not my generation. The generation that has become of my child who's 19 years old has been lost with hard work. What hard work truly is about I'm not being um, automatically dependent on your parents or to be, be dependent that you expect it and you deserve it. Um, entitled to things. I think that that should be a key word that people understand is entitlement is, that's not life. That's fantasy. Okay. That's complete fantasy world. Being entitled to something is fantasy world. Everybody is, is created equal and you got to work your ass off to become a successful person. And if you don't, you're going to get eaten up by this world. And that's what I tell my son. I mean, you got to work hard, boy. I mean, right now he's in uh, Pittsburgh. He's uh, wrestling against Pennsylvania. I mean, he, he understands because he's traveling, he's seen the, the country and he's never had before. And he, he's like, dad, I'm glad you prepared me for this. And like with my young ones, I don't talk to them as kids. I mean, yeah, we have our, our father, son time during the weekends, but during the week, I talk to them like, like adults, like plain. I mean, I don't cuss, we don't do them like that. I mean, I try to explain to them, cussing is uh, for stupid people. Those are the people who can understand the words to articulate what they want to say. So they put in a cuss word instead. Instead of putting in a cuss word, why don't you think of a, a, a verb or a word to describe the word you're trying to say? And they get it and they understand it. And once again, it's just, uh, I, I, I really have learned through the trials and errors that I have through my life. I mean, I'm 46 years old. Um, life has gone by so fast. And I try to tell them that knowledge is power. And if you're able to have the knowledge as much as possible and understand it and not think of it as a child, things will be a little bit more easy. But let's have fun. We'll have fun on the weekends, you know? We'll go play video games, you know? We'll, we'll go to the beach. Uh, we'll go fishing on the boat. I mean, I, I, I try to make it exciting for them, but I wanna make sure that I, I'm building and I'm molding these into men. I'm not, I'm not building kids. I'm not building boys. Um, I'm building men. And, and that's my goal. That's what I wanna do. So when I look back, 
when I'm 60, 70 years old and go, these kids are doing Fortune 500 uh, companies and I've done something right. They're respectful. They treat others like the way they want to be treated. I'm doing something right. Um, they have values. Uh, they, 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 help, they hold themselves uh, with higher standards. I'm doing something right. And I think that's important because nowadays a lot of parents give their kids everything they want, become yeah. I'm 18, all of a sudden it's like, mom, dad, I need help here. I need help there. I need help. Yeah, give them a little bit of help. But when they fall down, don't let them have to go to reach trying to pick them up. Let them try to get up on themselves. Give them an the opportunity. And I think it's important because that's what life's really about is learning from your mistakes and trying to process it the right way where you're able to have a positive outlook of going, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Absolutely. And if you give your kids everything, they're just going to expect that through life. You're actually setting them up for failure. 100%. You, I can't agree with you more, man. I, and once again, I, I, I got to be very thankful for my, my fiance Amber that I've been with now for eight years, and me or her on the same page. And it's teamwork. It's teamwork, one hundred percent. You know, sometimes she's the, the 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 mean parent. Sometimes I'm the mean parent. You know, um, it's just we don't spank our kids. Um, right. Don't do because I make them work out. You know, we we do they do stairs for an hour. I mean, Isaac kid i've never had to run stairs ever for an hour straight we did it 15 minutes and that was hell in that <laughs> yeah, you know and it's crazy because it's barriers in the brain that they're automatically going i can do this for an hour i go well you guys only have to do half an hour today like they're excited about it. like oh only half an hour think about running the stairs for half an hour how hard that truly can be but once again I'm, I'm molding these um boys minds to be stronger than ever so when they are put in hard positions or hard points, uh, like I was when I was a kid, when I got into wrestling, I was cutting weight. I didn't understand what I was doing, but a coach pulled me aside and kind of taught me the the ropes of it. And um, it was hard because when I got into fighting, I had to do the same thing and it became easier because I was able to learn the progression of, of cutting the weight, doing it the right way, eating the right amount, sacrificing the right time to make the weight at the time that I need to make it. Yeah. Are you? Are, are we going to see the kids following in uh, daddy's footsteps or are you training him for that type of a career? Well, um, my oldest, uh, like I said, he wrestles at Arizona State University. Um, he's starting as a freshman. Uh, so my deal with all three of them, if they want to fight, um, they have to get their master's degree first. Um, I don't care what it is, business. And my my oldest, he he's already uh, a major right now in business. Uh, but my twins, one of them, he wants to be an attorney. Um, and the other one, he said he wants to fight. And I said, well, you gotta get your master's first. So that's our, that's my goal that I've set, set for them. So they understand if they want to fight, they gotta get the master's first. Um, so education, once again, in our household is very important. And, uh, the twins, they do jujitsu, they wrestle, but my oldest, like I say, he wrestles at a, a division one, uh, ASU. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I want to let them do what they want to do. Fighting yeah. is hard. Um, it's very challenging mentally and physically. Um, and it's a grind. It's a grind on your body, a grind on your mind, but it does mold men. That's for sure. And wrestling mold men. So that's why I have them in wrestling. Um, and the boys are in jujitsu so they can defend themselves very well. And they carry themselves with a different demeanor. I think, uh, just walking around with their friends or just hanging out with people or just even going into a room with a bunch of people, how they carry themselves, you know, they're not shy. They don't put their head down. I don't, I don't give my twins that are 12. They don't have cell phones. They don't have iPads. They haven't had iPads or cell phones since they've been four. Um, and the only reason why that, because their mother, uh, uh, that I had separated when they were four, um, used to give everything they wanted, buy everything they want, buy shoes, everything, buy like Louis Vuitton shoes and like just crazy, stupid money spending, um, giving them iPads, had nannies in the house and everything. And it was something that really didn't, I didn't want, but I loved her so much. I was willing to give up everything to make sure that I kept her, but not coming to realize that I had to make the same decision my mother made with my father because my ex, she had a drug, drug problem. And I had to make sure that I made the right decision for the future of my children and not be selfish for the love I had for her. And once again, I go for the selfish of myself. It wasn't about me and fighting. It, it, fight time, yes. After the fight, it's my children's time. And this decision that I made saved my children's life. And it saved my life, I think. Uh, saved my career. It saved all my businesses. It saved everything because over the last uh, eight and a half years, she's been non-existent. Um, and, and the boys understand that we had to go through therapy, but Amber has stepped up as a mother. Um, I think God sent me an angel. I'm very, very thankful because she stepped up like no mother I, I've ever seen. And 
um, everything I've ever wanted as a mom. You know, as a kid growing up, you always think about having the white picket fence, the beautiful house, you know, living yeah. on the water as I am, um, having the nice cars as I do. That was always been my American dream. And to have that, I had it. I had everything. And then I had to redo myself all over again eight and a half years or eight and a half years ago. And I have it now. I have someone that we're a team. We, we, we inspire each other. She's a hard worker, but she has time for the children. I'm a hard worker. I have time for the children. And we, we collaborate together to make this family, the Ortiz family, super solid. And I think that's very important because I have enough money where I can do whatever I want, go wherever I want, travel wherever I want, have my kids go into private school and things like that. I, but no, I want my kids to be a part of society to understand what's going wrong, what's going on around their uh, their lives, what's going on in our society. And it's important. You know, I talk politics to them. I talk about uh, how people are being groomed. I talk about uh, the deception that the media is showing. And, and, and I show from here, what do you see in this? What do you see in this? And they tell me and they see right through it. And children, they are so honest that they... The, the, they haven't been really brainwashed to, to see what media is really doing to some of the kids. Yeah. But some of the kids, yes. Um, and it's crazy because when was it last father's day, I was sitting in the morning, woke up in the morning, watching Nickelodeon with my children. And all of a sudden a commercial comes on and it said, black fathers matter. My son looks at me and goes, dad, I thought all fathers matter. I go, bingo son. I go, see what they're trying to show. I go, all fathers do matter. Every father's matter, no matter what, black, white, yellow, brown, it does not matter. All fathers matter. And that's what they're trying to do is trying to separate us. He goes, that's not right. They shouldn't be doing things like that. A 12 year old is saying this. And I just, it made me feel good because I'm building children that understand society, how it's being portrayed right now. And I never right. thought to this point of where it is at, of the division of our country, um, it's scary because at the end of the day, I'm an American. Um, yes, I have Mexican blood in me. I have uh, Native American blood in me. I have Irish blood in me. I have French blood in me. I have Cameroon blood in me. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, I'm an American. I, I care about this country. This country is my number one. And I think people really forget about that because I see a lot of, a lot of kids that are in the, I don't know, 25 and younger age, they say, you know, we hate America. <laughs> Have any of those children or young adults ever traveled outside the country? <laughs> you ain't kidding. Guarantee you 100% of the time they have not. Um, and I have. I, I've been to China. I've been to Korea. I've been to Japan. I've been to Australia. I've been to Thailand. I've been to Mexico, Mexico City. Um, God, Guatemala, um, Peru. I mean, I've been everywhere but Russia. That's the only place I haven't been yet in this country or in this world uh, but I've seen how different uh, demographics of uh, parts of the world that how separated and some aren't separate. Like in Japan, it's all Japanese. I mean, yes, you have a few Americans, a few African-Americans or um, Nigerians or, you know, people from different parts of the world, but mostly strictly uh, Japanese in that area. And a lot of places are like that. And I think the most diverse country in the world is America. And I think people come to America thinking of that American dream, thinking that it's possible for them. And it is. And I want to make sure you understand that I'm living proof that it is. I could have been a drug addict or a, in prison or dead or where I am right now. Um, those are my choices in life. And I chose to be a victor. I refuse to be a victim. And I, I, I work hard as a father um, and I make sure that I have my children have everything they, they want. But I make sure they you know they have to work for it. You know, like my son's. Uh, for Christmas time, you know, they're like, dad, please, can you give me the uh, knock list, the uh, vision thing? And can you, uh, my, the son's like, dad, can I please all I want is a monitor? I go, cool. You guys get straight A's. You can have whatever you want. Yeah. It, um, I, that's so awesome that your son actually pushed back on that when he saw that on TV. I just got to ask, you, you was telling me that your kids were homeschooling. How much do you think that played into that, that they didn't have that uh, agenda that's being shoved down all of our children's throats, probably coming from the public school and, and how that played back into him being able to uh, make his own um, reality and, and question those narratives being pushed? I mean, you know, I think it really comes about just to, to the factor of um, in our household, I have no, there's no color discrimination at all. I, I don't see a person's right. a person's character, plain and simple. And it's kind of funny because when they were about eight years old, uh, they were, we were in school at the time and uh, 
they came home after school and they're like, dad, dad, I met this cool friend. You got to meet him. Some brown kid. He's so cool. I was like, really? Oh, I'll meet him tomorrow. And I said, I want to go pick him up. And he's like, dad, dad, here he is. It's our, it's our friend uh, Jerome. I was like, right on, cool. And it was a little African-American kid. I was like, and it made me proud just to think that they saw no, no skin color. And the kid was, was light brown, but he was African-American kid. And it was for, for him to call, my son to call him a brown kid because of the color, and that was it. He didn't understand that it was African-American or, or black and Mexican or brown and Asians are yellow. And it's like, they never understood that at all because we don't talk like that. That's not the type of things we do. And I think a lot of parents need to be hand on to understand and see what the curriculum that the schools are teaching to their children um, before just letting them go. Because I know a lot of parents, they got jobs, mothers and fathers, they got jobs. So their big thing is to drop them off at school. They drop them off at school and they don't worry about them until they have to pick them up. They pick them up, they get them back home, they got to cook dinner, they got to go to bed, they got to wake up and do the same thing. And it's like a grind. It's in and out, in and out every day. They don't really see the curriculum that's being taught to the child during the year. And a lot of the kids get lost by doing that. And I have a lot of friends who have kids that they've uh, grown up in the last, you know, five, six, seven years that their children think totally different than they think. They are like, I hate America. I hate this place. You know, and they're talking about Marxism and things like this. And I'm just like, where were you when they were in school? How come you weren't overlooking that? Like, oh, I was really busy. This and that to do. And I think nowadays, a lot of parents need to be hands on with their children. And that's why I pulled my kids out of school for the mask mandate here in California. I, I'm not putting my child in a mask. I refuse to do it. I don't wear a mask. I haven't been sick all year. I sh I've shaken over 100,000 hands. I go to Vegas all the time. I take my kids with me. We're walking in the casinos. My kids don't wear masks. None of us has been, have been sick. Um, and don't get me wrong, COVID's real. It's a serious flu. I get it. Um, but at the same time, what they're trying to do to our children right now is going to be very detrimental to their future. Psychologically. And the things that they got to live with for the future. Uh, the critical race theory is another thing that they try to teach in our schools. I'm not doing that. I pulled my kids. I put them in um, in uh, homeschool. Uh, the sexual ed. You know, do not confuse my child if he's gay or not. I have no problem with no. gay. People. I have yeah. gay friends. If you're 18, you have an opportunity to make your decision. Up to 18, you're molding a child to be an adult. Do not brainwash them. Do not. They're so just easy to listen to other things around them and think that's the way it is because everybody else is saying i mean to be um around a bunch of kids and you're like oh yeah well that kid was the one of the tough kids and that kid's not really a tough kid that's kid's not really a tough kid that kid's a really tough kid so that's the bully that's automatically how they think now all of a sudden it's like yeah that kid kind of says that he's a girl but he's not sure and then that one says that girl says he's a guy but she's not sure but then all of a sudden they have adults pushing saying it's okay to think like that you need to think like that so they're weakening our society, plain and simple. Um, and it, it, I want to make sure that I have control of my children's future. And I like to say, uh, for your viewers, I hope I'm not um, disturbing or uh, um, hurting anybody's feelings. But this is truthfully, as a father, that I got to stand up for my children. If I don't do it, the government's not going to do it. And we've sh we've seen this over the last two years. The government don't care about us. All they care about is the mighty dollar, plain and simple. And it's just, uh, it's embarrassing. And it's it's scary to me because as a father and a hard worker where I came from nothing, came from the streets, came from living on government cheese with my parents, uh, living in motels, living in cars, living in garages, to owning a $3 million home on the water, owning, buy, buying my mom a home for Christmas, owning a Rolls Royce van, owning a, a 38 foot um, speedboat by my house. And yes, those are materialistic things, but those were goals in my life that I wanted to achieve. You know, becoming a world champion, that was my goal in life I wanted to achieve. Getting my AA degree, that was a goal in my life I wanted to achieve. Having this stuff on this island where I live, this is a goal in my life that I wanted to achieve, to knowing that the American dream is alive and don't let it go. Don't let society take over your mentality to lose your dream. And that's what I try to teach my children is to keep dreaming, to keep working hard, just to be dedicated to yourself. And once again, I could just say is that we have two things for the rest of our lives, our word and our name. Don't tarnish or anything and always keep your word. And I think that's really, really important. There's nothing on the face of this earth that if you don't put the work in that you can achieve, you know, and, and I got to agree with you, brother. I got a friend right now, Tito, 
in the state of Texas, they have been trying to uh, transgender his son since his son was seven years old. They send him to school in a wig and a dress. His name is James. They call him Luna. They literally want to chemically castrate. Uh, he was seven. He's nine now and took custody away from the father because he does not want this to happen. That's what we're living in right now. Um, it, it's 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 sad. Um, I feel for kids like that because they're so confused and they can really be pushed the right way. And it's not wrong or right, um, but I, I think at the end of the day, um, is we got two genders. We got male and female. That's yep. it. That's all it is. We become 18, 20, 21, you know, what, and you figure out what life's about, and then you can make the decision because that decision is going to affect your life for the rest of your life. That's important. When you're a child, you, you can really be involved in something you don't know what it really is when you get older. I think it's uh, once again, it's my opinion. I, I, I just it scratches my head because I, if parents that think like that, then try to have a girl. If you have a girl, try to have a boy. I mean, have another kid then. Try to have another kid, but don't try to uh, change their sex in their mind when they're so young and they're not. They don't even know. They're just uh, they're they're so easy to perceive what's in front of them and they don't realize what's going on. Yeah, man. A uh, few quick things before I get you out of here. You know, you was talking about how you know in life we're gonna make mistakes, but We've got to learn from them. We, we can't keep making the same mistakes. The only way to progress in life is say, okay, I did that, but I'm going to move forward. Um, being uh, that you got full custody of your kids, uh, you know, I've, I've read a little bit about it, but you talk about how you really didn't want to lose that relationship and you, you was wanting to hold on, but you realized the damage that it was going on. What was that like for you as a father um, having to make that choice, Tito? Because I know that couldn't have been easy. It was the hardest thing in my life to love somebody so much you're willing to sacrifice everything in the world for. And I was willing to sacrifice my career for it. I was, I was at the top of my game. Um, you know, and yeah, I lost a few fights, but still I was one of the most notable notor notoriety fighters in the UFC. Um, I was willing to give up everything for it, but I did what my mom did. And I didn't realize it until after I did it, that that's exactly what it was. You know, my mother, and my father were going through and I, I went through the, seven years of watching the heroin addiction problem and the things that I seen as a kid, I probably should have never seen, but I didn't want my kids to go through the same situation. Um, when they were born, my ex started getting addicted to Oxycontin. Um, all of a sudden I started finding cocaine in the house, empty bottles of champagne. Um, things that I realized that our family was going down the tubes that we were going to lose everything. She went from having, 18 million or 15 million dollars to having two million dollars in three years wow and i told her what are you doing you're gonna spend everything you're not gonna have anything left she's like don't fucking tell me what to do i'm like i'm telling you and i told her because my idea was always what am i gonna do for the future what am i gonna do when i'm 40 what am i gonna do when i'm 50 am i gonna have this money when i'm that time and i know money's not gonna be there forever you know i, I look at my net worth and you know it says 20 million dollars well i've gave 10 of that million to the government for my taxes the other money i was able to kind of you know, roll into real estate roll into things that i've wanted roll into you know investments but i've always understood what's the next step um i had to make the same decision my mother did and it was the hardest thing in my life because i had to put my children first and for someone um jenna jameson um, was my ex and she was the most beautiful, articulate, smart woman that I've ever met at the time. Um, and I loved her like no other. She destroyed me. <laughs> she destroyed me mentally, physically sometimes. Uh, the things that she would say to me was, you know, you're just like your piece of shit dad. Um, just things just to dwindle what I had in my mind. You know, there was times I'd be up in Big Bear for training camp. She would come up on the weekends. Uh, and my coaches were building me up during the week. And then she'd come on the weekend and destroy me until Sunday. And all of a sudden I had to redo. And it was one of my friends, Paul uh, Lacanina, who lives in Florida, who was my strength and conditioning coach. Um, he'd go, Tito. And this is after we already got split up. And he's like, I'm finally happy you're, you're done with that. Because every single week that I came up to Big Bear on Monday, we'd be there until Friday. He goes, I would have to build you up every single week. Every Monday I would come in and you'd feel like you were just a battered person. And I was like, you seen that? He goes, yeah. He goes, you made the right decision. And I made the decision for the for the future of my children. I want to, I don't want to put my kids through what I went through as a child. 
to the scene of the yeah. drugs and the, the screaming and the yelling and the fighting and everything. I didn't want to throw my children through that. So I was willing to sacrifice my relationship and my feelings and myself for my children. And I did that. And I was thankful I did that because I remember sitting with my attorney um, a year when it happened. I got a restraining order and she goes, Tito, I know it's really, 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 really hard right now. She goes, but a year from now, remember this, a year from now, you're going to be thanking me. You're going to be thanking me, saying, thank you so much. And I got, got on this truth. Year to a date. <laughs> I called her crying saying, thank you so much. You have changed my life. You have made my children's future better. And it was no joke. It was no joke. She was completely right because I was in a toxic relationship where I was trying to fix someone that I couldn't fix. And I come to realize when I talked to my psychologist, what I was doing, I was trying to fix my mom. And I couldn't fix my mom because it wasn't my mom. Was, oh, yeah. Was someone who had a problem that I couldn't, I couldn't help because they didn't want to help themselves. And I was doing everything. You know, I was taking her to rehab. I was doing, I went sober for a full year. I didn't have to drink no alcohol or nothing. I was like, I was completely stone cold sober because I told her that I could do it. And she would fall off the wagon all the time. I was like, I was just like, I was chasing my tail over and over and over. And I, I had to say enough's enough, you know, and uh, almost 19 years ago, or excuse me, um, almost nine years ago in April, will be in April, um, that, that she's been gone and my life's been happy. I'm, I've been very, very fortunate. Not fortunate just for myself, because yeah, myself, it matters, but my children, that's my number one is my children. That's my legacy is my children. And I made a decision for their future and they understand it now they get it. And they don't have no mother missing um, mentality or an idea is because Amber's been there 100% of the time. You know, she loves them. She hugs them. She kisses them, saying how proud she is of them. But she's hard on them, just hard enough to give them that mentality to know what you got to work for. That you're not going to get pushed over because of this. And um, unfortunately, man, unfortunately, like I said, God sent me an angel and I'm very, very thankful. Um, and I, I just try to progress in life and look back on that as a learning process, look back on that, that I don't have to be in that situation ever again. Um, and cause it, it, it did hinder my career. It did hinder uh, a lot of my training stuff during camps. Um, you know, I went five years that I didn't win a fight. <laughs> and it was during that time I was with her. All of a sudden when I got away from her, I won my first fight against Ryan Bader. And it was like, wow, this is what positive mentality feels like. This is what not being around someone toxic feels like. And it was a great feeling because I had someone around me that was saying I'm a good person, saying that, you know, you can do this. I know you can do this. You're, you're going to do great. You know, you're, you're a great father. Things that human beings need in life. They need a positive reinforcement, a positive mindset to be successful each and every day. And these are the type of things that I've learned that, you know, I go out and I do motivational speeches and so forth that I've learned in life because it's life lessons. It's not something that I picked a book up and I read. It was something that I've learned and I went through and I put myself through and it was hard times and it was crying and, you know, and, and woes me. I mean, to eight and a half, was it? 10 years ago, um, I got accused of uh, abusing Jenna and all the charges were dropped because it was not true. And I thought it was the end of my life. I had a handful of Xanax, well, 10 of them. I was drunk drinking my buddies that night. Got back to the hotel because I couldn't come to my house because I had a restraining order against me. And I said, you know what? Fuck this. Life's over. Popped the pills in my mouth. And the first thing that popped in my face was my son Jacob's face. I was like, spit him out. Cried, went to bed, woke up in the morning, and I was alive. That was because my child's face was when I was going, I can't let my child down. And I was Jacob. And now I, I, I'm thankful because, I mean, was that... Angel that sat down and said, stop and realize what you're doing because I, I was drunk and I could have, I, I could have easily swallowed those 10 Xanax and I would never woke up. I would have been gone. But to willing to realize what's around me and willing to realize that I can be different. I can change my surrounding and um, I can only control what's around me and what's in my circle. And it's the only thing I can control that is in my circle. I can't control anything outside of society. And I kind of realized that it took me just up to the end of this year to realize that I can only control my circle. I can only control what's around me. I can only control the people that I, that I associate myself with and associate that are around me. That's all I can control. I can't control what's happening in the Congress. I can't control what's happening in the state. You know, I tried to run for city council. I ran for city council here in Huntington Beach. I got the most votes in Huntington Beach history. I was mayor pro tem, but I wasn't a part of the agenda. I wasn't a Democrat, as they say. Um, I was 
stirring the pot that they didn't want to be stirred. I was pulling, you know, pulling the curtain from behind the wizard, and they didn't want that to happen. Um, so they attacked me. They attacked my character. They attacked me. They attacked me personally. They uh, went after my kids. Um, they were destroying my future. And one of my buddies told me, said, Tito, they will spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to destroy you because you're not a part of the agenda. And that's when I had to step away. I said, you know what? I'm resigning. Thank you for all my uh, voters who donated, everybody who had believed in me. I'm very thankful. The first time in my life that I quit doing something, but my children are my number one. This is my, my future. My children are my number one. If I lose everything, I have nothing for them. Now, if I get away from this, now I can rebuild my businesses. People see how honest I am. And that's one of the things. I can't be a politician if I'm so damn honest. You know, I, I got to be honest with myself. I got to look in the mirror at night and I got to brush my teeth and I got to tell myself, you know, have you done something good today? Yes. Have you done the honest thing today? Yes. Do you break laws? No. I've been doing this now for 25 years, 30 years. You know, I'm 46 so up to about, you know, 15, 16 years old. I cause trouble all the time. I'd still shit. I just... I wanted to be what my friends were, and I didn't have that because my parents were there for me. And I come to realize that's not the way to do it. You got to work hard, you got to respect, and uh, you got to have values, and you got to dedicate yourself to something that you want to achieve. And uh, I have achieved those things through hard work and respect and values and dedication and just things that I want for my children. And I can't tell my children one thing and do another. I got to stick to my guns on everything I do. And when I stepped down from city council, it was a blessing in disguise. And come to realize that. I'm not a part of the agenda, man. And it's scary. Dude, that, that, that was powerful. Yeah, I could do a whole episode with you. Maybe we can talk again later on about the politics. I, I understand uh, not being a part of that swamp and not fitting in where they are. Um, it's, our, our politics are full of it. It, it really is full of it, man. Um, but I got to ask you a fanboy uh, question really quick. I know we got to wrap up here in a second. Uh, who was your toughest opponent out of your whole career? Toughest opponent? Um, God, I'd say Chuck Liddell. Chuck Liddell is my mm -hmm. toughest opponent. I, I just, it was, it was, okay, you know, I'll take that back. Toughest opponent because I didn't want to fight him because I, I, I thought he was my friend. I thought he was my buddy. And it, it, when you have a relationship with somebody, it's hard to hurt him. And it's hard to have that anger and that emotion to beat a person that you actually care about. A person that I really didn't care about, that I respect more than anything, that's a really close friend of mine right now, is Randy Couture. I'd say that'd be my hardest fight. Um, he took my world title away from me. I thought my career was over. I mean, this in 2003. Uh, and I had no respect for him. He was 40 years old. You know, I was 30, what, 32, 31, um, a world champion. And I was like, I, I'm, I'm going to beat this guy. And he beat me five straight rounds and took my belt and... Um, I cried in my hotel room that night, uh, thinking my life was over. I got out of the shower from crying and I looked in the mirror and said, Tito, as I do all the time is have a conversation with myself. I said, Tito, time to pick yourself up, wipe those fucking tears, go out and have fun tonight and get your ass back in the gym on Monday. Cause I wasn't injured. I had no, no, no problems with me. So I was like, all right, I did that. I went out and I had fun that night, woke up in the morning, packed my stuff up in Vegas, drove back home. Um, Sunday, Monday morning, I got back in the gym and I started training and, uh, God, from 2003 all the way up to 2019, I continued to compete and I love it. It's exciting. It's just that, that, that motivation, that feeling of preparing for a fight. There's nothing like it to watch my body transform from, you know, kind of a dad body looking to a chiseled specimen. And to be to be in the best shape possible, hitting mitts for 15 rounds and just running four miles and getting it done, you know, in, in like 28 minutes. I mean, it's just it's it's crazy the things that you put your body through, but it's all psychological. When yep. you if you can do something, you can do anything. When you say you can't do something, that's when you lose. That's when you're done. That's when you can't do it because it's once again the mind is so strong. People don't realize it because they're always doubted, and to be that person to be doubted. It's, it's hard to have success from that. But if you're the person that believes in yourself, you have other people around you who believe in that same positivity, you, you can be untouchable. And it's, it's crazy in the sport of mixed martial arts because anybody could lose at any certain time of choke, punch, kick, submission. Um, there's so many ways to win that you never know who's going to win that night. And there's always so many upsets because it all comes down to how the fight camp went. How the fight camp went is how the fight's going to be. And I can't count how many fights that 
I've done the same thing over and over and over in repetition that the fight went exactly like that. And it was just yeah. a, it, it's crazy that I can look back at my, his, my career and uh, to say that I'm still competing at uh, 46 years old, I'll be 47 in two weeks. Uh, but to have the physique and the mindset and the train of thought that I have, the things that I've gone through, you know, and I'm on social media, of course, on Instagram, Tito Ortiz 1999. And you got to look me up. You got to literally got to type it in. I was going to ask you that. 1999 because I'll be in shadow band. They don't like the truth. Uh, but to have the knowledge and the stuff that I've gone through my life of just training and life and fatherhood and, you know, business savvy, the stuff that I've gone through, um, it's been great. You know, through UFC, I got a master's in promotion, <laughs> literally a master's in promotion from UFC for free. It wasn't free, but I mean, I, I, I guess I had to pay for it physically and mentally, but, uh, I learned a lot from it. I learned a whole lot, you know, of, of the business partners I have of starting other businesses. And it, it's been important, you know, working for Donald Trump in 2008, I was a celebrity apprentice, the things I learned from that, just in life lessons that I've, I was able to learn, I'm able to use that as knowledge as power. And uh, I'll continue to do it. Like I say, my, my mind's young, I'm, I'm sharp, as, uh, sharp as a nail. I'm, you know, I, everything I do, it's uh, very, methodic but very thought process where i'm able to to do things the right way i think now and not make mistakes gotcha man hey where can everybody keep up with you and reach out i know you just mentioned your instagram i'm glad you said something because i was looking you up the other day to get on the social media after we talked and uh your profile would not pull up brother no it would not pull up and when it says when yeah. you follow me and it was funny because over the last was it two days i've got five thousand followers uh but when you go to follow me, it says, are you sure you want to follow this person? Because he posts yeah. uh, misinformation on COVID. <laughs> People, look, Tito Ortiz, 1999. You got to literally got to put it in T-I-T-O-O-R-T-I-Z, 1999. Um, there's another one that says 19999, has five nines, not, or four nines, not three. Um, that's not me. I'm the one with the blue check mark. But scroll through it and look through the stuff that I post. Look through everything I post. So they call it conspiracy theories. Well, now I'm calling spoiler alerts because all the shit's coming true. And I do my research. And I and 2020 really made me open my eyes. And it's scary because I wish I never would have done it. I wish I can go back and rechange that and not really um, open my eyes. But I guess I open my eyes for the right reasons because I open a lot of other people's eyes. And it's important because this country is in dire, dire straits where we, we need help. We need something for the future of our children. We need the future of this country. And it's important because there's only one country like this in this world, and it's called the United States of America. And it's important, and it's important to me. I have a lot of friends who are special force guys, a lot of friends who serve, uh, a lot of police officer friends. And um, it's crazy how much uh, the government overreach is. It's just, it's scary. Uh, and I say, all of us Americans need to stand up. We need to stand up for our rights and stand up for our freedoms, you know? I remember uh, 2020, they said, oh, it's only 15 days. Oh, it's only a mask. Oh, it's only, it's only a vaccine. Oh, now it's only a vaccine mandate. Oh, now it's only a vaccine card. Um, you got to show proof of papers. People, if they don't understand anything of history, please look up history. Please look what they did in Germany. Look at the things that happened. And because there's so much that it just rolls into exact what's going on right now. And it's scary. Um, now, once again, I, I, I don't want to get into too much because then people say, oh, Tito's crazy. And let me tell you, I'm far from crazy. I'm far from stupid. I'm very educated and not, I mean, book educated, yes, but more than anything, street wise, like you never, I mean, I've done things that people that are 70 who have never done, um, that have seen, that have been through, that have, that have treated, that have put their lives through those things. And like I said, I, I, I've learned things. I, I learn things every day. I never stop learning. I learn every single day. Um, but once again, it's just this society right now as fathers, um, mothers, single mothers, single fathers, or families, uh, pay attention to your children's future because your children weren't asked to be brought to this earth. You wanted them here. So it's your obligation, your duty to be a true parent, to be a present parent, to tell your kid you love them every day, to say that you're proud of them. Because as a kid, because I still feel like a kid, as a kid, that's all I ever want to hear from my father was, son, I'm proud of you. Son, I love you. And I never heard that. And that's what I tell my kids every single day. I said, father, I mean, Boys, I'm really proud of you. I give them a big hug. We can make sure we give at least five hugs a day, at least. Every single day, you got to give them the five hugs a day. Um, and tell them you love them. Because as human nature, we want affection. And affection is important. Uh, we want positive support. 
You know, if they make a mistake, say, damn it, you're doing that damn wrong. No, tell them, how can we, how can we make this better? What can we do to make this better the next time? Instead of just telling your kid, no, because I said so. Don't do that. That's wrong. Tell them no and tell them the reasons why you should do it or the reasons they should not do it. And make them understand the fact between right and wrong. I mean, that's important. If you just tell them no because I said so, that's not giving them an answer. These kids have seen, are seeing things for the first time in their lives. They've never seen it before. You may have seen all these things before, and that's why I always got to check myself because I'm like, oh, my son never seen it before, so I got to explain it to him. And I want to explain it to them so they understand and they have they can have their own articulate um, mindsets of what's going on in the surroundings. And it's important. I tell them to watch their surroundings wherever they go, watch out for people. And there's been a few times that my kids have, have, have really protected themselves because they watch their surroundings. And it's important because, once again, as parents, we're, we're molding men or we're molding, we're molding women. And it's important that we do it the right way with, uh, you know, like I said, we use our two rules, our, keep our word and our name. And that's very important to our family. That's it. Hey, Tito, it's been an honor, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, you know, what's next for you? What, what's coming up next? Uh, gosh, uh, I got a few appearance stuff uh, in Florida. Um, I'm actually uh, looking to upgrade my home, sell my home, or possibly move into Florida um, so my kids can go back to school so they can enjoy uh, uh, high school years. Um, I'm possibly fighting maybe in March, April. Uh, um, I just started uh, training here last week and I really started from zero because I took uh, about three months off after my loss against Anders Silva. They say when you get knocked out, you got to make sure you clear all the webs out of your brain completely, let your body heal completely. So I did that. Um, but at the same time, I didn't train. I didn't raise my heart rate. And that's a little bit of a problem because now I got to build my blocks up again. Uh, but uh, I'll be fighting again this year for sure. Um, I'm excited. I said once again, I still I feel like I'm on on target where I need to be. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it's about my kids, man. I, I got to make sure my children have a great future. And uh, they say you become what you surround yourself with. And I've been surrounding myself with very successful, smart people. And I'm going to continue doing that. All right. Hey, brother, I appreciate it, man. Awesome, man. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. And for all your listeners, thank you. Um, hope you guys learned something from this. As fathers, uh, I say fathers, uh, don't do what your dad did if your dad did something wrong. And if your dad was great to you, don't do the opposite. Uh, treat your children like you've never seen anything ever before and teach them the right way. And uh, make sure, like I said, education is very, very important. But make sure you're watching of what they're being taught uh, in the curriculum. It's very important. As parents, we got to be responsible. Our children are our next generation, our next future. And I uh, hope you guys love this uh, podcast. That's it. All right, brother.